On July 6, 1973, Our Lady appeared to Sister Agnes Sasagawa and following a beautiful prayer of consecration to the Lord Jesus, Our Lady said, Pray very much for the Pope, bishops, and priests. Since your baptism, you have always prayed faithfully for them. Continue to pray very much, very much. Mm -hmm. Today, we have a guest who is going to show us and tell us about a wonderful way that we can accomplish praying for our priests. Next on Mother and Refuge of the End Times. Hello, viewers. Welcome to Mother and Refuge of the End Times. My name is Gina. I am happy to be your host today. And I am so excited to introduce to you my dear friend, Jeanette Howe. Jeanette, how are you today? I am good, good, and especially to be joined by you and welcomed by you and see what the Lord has for this hour. Oh, I'm so excited about this. Before we start to tell you our exciting plan for praying for priests, let's start with a prayer for priests. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Yeah. Keep them, I pray thee, dearest Lord, Keep them, for they are thine, thy priests, whose lives burn out before thy consecrated shrine. Keep them, for they are in the world, though from the world apart. When earthly pleasures tempt a lure, shelter them in thy heart. Keep them and comfort them in hours of loneliness and pain when all their life of sacrifice for souls seems but in vain. Mm -hmm. Keep them and oh, remember Lord, they have no one but thee, yet they have only human hearts with human frailty. Mm -hmm. Keep them spotless as the host that daily they caress, their every thought and word and deed, deign dearest Lord to bless. Mm -hmm. Mary, queen of the clergy, pray for them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jeanette, <laughs> it, welcome welcome to our show. I am so excited to have you here. As you can see, I get choked up whenever I pray for or talk about our priests because they are vital to our salvation. Without our priests, we don't have the sacraments. And it's the sacraments that bring us our promised salvation from the Lord Jesus. So Jeanette, why don't you tell us about your fantastic apostolate? Okay, so um, just like things in the church, things in the world, things that the Lord, I guess, deigns to, to happen, they start really small, right? And um, he himself came so small in the womb. So um, I began praying for my pastor at the Cathedral of St. Paul. Uh, and just offering this holy hour once a week. I, I, I saw a generosity in his priesthood and his love of, of being a priest. And I just began to offer a holy hour once a week for him, unbeknownst to him. I began doing this for, I would say about nine months. I'm not thinking about anybody joining me or me doing anything other than that. And it was in a way a special hour because he didn't know about it, and it was a hidden hour. Sometimes Father would come into the chapel while I was praying, and it was such a treat just to say, I, I hope this is befitting to you because it is it is really blessing me to pray for you. But at about nine months, I was praying this, offering this hour, which had become very familiar, and I look forward to it every week. And during that hour, uh, impressed in my heart, not, not really anything audible, but in my heart, the word seven sisters. And it meant nothing to me. My mother was one of seven biological sisters. I wasn't thinking about her. And I just sat with it because I thought maybe um, the Lord is directing me to pray the seven sorrows chaplet. 
I was meditating on the wounds of Christ at the time uh, on behalf of Father. But when I reached in to get the Seven Sorrows Chaplet, that word, those two words came back to me, very firm, uh, Seven Sisters. So I did, uh, in a moment, I sat down, and uh, in, in that moment, it was very clear to me. This was such an edifying time for me. I hoped it was edifying for Father. It was benefiting him. Um, and what if others filled in that whole week, so seven all together, so we would have this seamless holy hour for Father? I couldn't do it all, but six other sisters in Christ could help. And so I went back to that hour of prayer, though. That's what I was there for, not to really gain any good ideas during this hour. And I opened that up uh, to Father the next week. Should it's remarkable. <laughs> that is a remarkable story. Jeanette, that's amazing that it started with something so simple as just simple. you doing it. It's right. like, did you recall or was, just, was this just a thought that you had just one day or... Yeah, I mean, again, as I said, it was it was before the Blessed Sacrament, and it was during the Holy Hour. It was I I offered my Holy Hour during the Hour of Divine Mercy, so I was about midway during my Holy Hour at that time. Is what I I'm guess, guessing. It was on um, uh, March 24th, uh, and I so here it was the day before the Annunciation, and it's the tradition oh wow. feast day of Saint Gabriel, which again I wasn't connecting all of those things at that time. But it, it was in history that time. So when I opened it up to Father that next week, he 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 leaned back and he said he he took it all in. He said, I, I do believe this is from the Holy Spirit, but we have to test the spirit. So then he leaned forward and he had a plan right away. And he said, uh, ask six other women uh, to ask six, then six other women that they know. And we'll start seven groups of seven women for seven pastors and do that for a year. And then as St. Paul, go back and see how it's going. So that's the way it was. It was a very quiet start. And we were testing whether this was from the Holy Spirit. And as Father said on that first meeting day, if it is from the Holy Spirit, this will explode. This is needed. And and it has exploded. Yes. Annette, would you tell us a little bit about where it's come since, how far it's come since those days of just you by yourself at in the sacrament? Yeah, so we did pray that year faithfully from June of 2011 to June of 2012. And I, when I went back to learn what was happening, the testimonies were unbelievable. And so I brought them back to Father. He said, let's open the door. Let's just see what happens. There were no pamphlets. There were no booklets. There were no holy cards to pass out. He said, let's just see how spiritually organic uh, this will happen. So we opened the door in June and immediately there was a, a phone call from someone in Connecticut. How did that message get to Connecticut? You know, so I um, this woman had somehow heard about it from a friend in Minnesota that was doing this. She wondered if she could be a part of it. And then it grew and grew and grew till at this point, we have about 4,200 uh, or 4,300 maybe by this time active groups of at least seven people uh, praying for priests and bishops. That's incredible. And this, this apostolate is around the world. It is. We're in 33 countries. Uh, all 50 states of the United States have groups. Uh, most of the provinces in Canada have groups, and we're on every continent, six continents anyway. Yeah. that That is fantastic. Yeah. Well, let me share with you how I came to discover this. It's the, the amazing thing about this apostolate is it's very much a word of mouth kind of an apostolate. I didn't find this out from a pamphlet sitting in my parish. What I found out this, what, the way I found this out was a friend of my mother's named Connie, hi Connie, <laughs> <laughs> had shared with us, you know, often that she prays once a week for her pastor, for, for the pastor at her parish and that she's involved in Seven Sisters. And I talked with my mom about it and my mom has a day now as well. And I thought this could be a good opportunity for my parish. Mm -hmm. And I asked her to tell me more 
I asked Connie to tell me a little bit more about it. She sent me to the website. I ordered some materials. And, you know, I asked probably, probably a dozen women at my parish if they would be interested. And it was almost immediately I had six other women besides me willing to pray. It was within a week. It was absolutely within a week. And our pastor is very young. He's only been a priest for a little over three years. And um, it's, it's a tough time for the priests right now. It's a really tough time to be a priest. The world is a very difficult place. And um, when we decided to pray, it was at the last day of our parish fish fry. We all <laughs> happened to be together. We all said the prayer of commitment for the year right there. And we said to Father, Father, our, there's a group of seven of us and we are going to spend every day in the holy hour. And you could see it in his face, how moved he was. And every time he sees me in church on Saturday, he leans over to me and says, pray extra hard for me today. I know you pray, pray extra hard for me. So I do. <laughs> so, so, so tell me a little bit more. So tell me a little bit more about your thoughts. I just love to hear about some of the, some of the stuff that you've had. This probably isn't the only story that you've heard about this. I would love to hear some of the stories that you've heard over over the last several years that you've been doing this. Yeah, and, and some are so similar. And as you were speaking, uh, Gina, I was thinking about, well, they are fishermen of, you know, they are fishermen of men, and here you are at the fish fry. So it seemed fitting. Yeah, right? <laughs> but, no, it's just, it's been uh, very humbling, of course. Uh, the apostolate is hidden in the sense that we don't keep it hidden from the priest. We tell the priest, so he's open mm -hmm. to the graces, right? right? Or the bishop. But it's hidden in the sense that really the attraction uh, for the women to be a part of this is generally, I don't really care if anybody knows I'm praying, God's called me to do this and I'm going to do it. And the priest knows I'm praying and that's enough. And so there, there's that beautiful hidden aspect. And even and in that, there's so much happening, you know, in, in the unseen, right? And so I am privy sometimes uh, to hear some beautiful testimonies, both from priests and, and sisters alike. And um, one of them that I, I love telling over and over, because people kind of want to know, well, what are the priests sensing? And, and we don't go into this to, to really even desire to know that. If we learn things uh, about the priest's benefit, it's great. But we don't go in thinking, okay, he's gonna, we're gonna see these signs right away and know that it's our prayers, right? I always tell women, this is part of prayer that's going out to Father. We hope it's not the only prayer that's going out to Father, but we know it's it's necessary and it's part. But one priest in Florida said a beautiful thing that I believe is kind of like a quintessential answer of most priests. If they would be given the opportunity, this is what they would say. Because one of the things that we do and desire, we're praying for sanctity of the priest and their well-being and a greater devotion to Mary. So those are the, the three essential things. And then however the Holy Spirit leads each woman uh, is, is added to that. And so it, it, sanctity strengthens a, a, a man, right? Strengthens a woman. And so the, the sense is that there's a strength that will come about that this priest is ready for all that the Lord has given him to do. So this priest in Florida, who was a pastor of a, of, a, of a parish with many complexities, lots of, of needs, and he said, I need a lot of, of prayers, and I'm not afraid to ask for prayer. And he said, because I ask for prayer so readily, I don't always, I'm not able to say, well, this prayer helped there, and that prayer helped there. It's just, I understand the prayer is coming to me. But he said, I will say this about the seven sisters. He said, when they started praying their dedicated holy hours for my benefit, I stood taller. And such a beautiful way that a man would respond to a sense of prayer. But he connected that to those dedicated, I call them seamless holy hours, because there's a holy hour every single day without stop. So I, I believe, again, that it's just something that we, we trust for each priest and bishop that we pray for, that they feel strengthened for whatever work God is, is having them bring about. 
That is a beautiful, that is just a beautiful yeah. witness yeah. to the power of this, to the power of this ministry. Yeah. Um, I understand, I understand that Seven Sisters has created a little bit of a buzz among the bishops. Yeah. <laughs> So this was this is hearsay, but it's from a trustworthy source. So uh, a priest uh, friend of mine uh, said that the uh, his bishop told him that when he was at the Eucharistic Congress just recently in Indianapolis, that when he sat down for any meal, there was a discussion about seven sisters. And oh, it that's just, incredible. It just heartened him. And I was over the moon when I heard that. And, um, you know, it just was a beautiful thing. And he said that there were bishops from Australia that in particular said, we are believing seven sisters will be involved in a revival in our country. And wow, what a humbling statement. And these are from bishops that are the overseers really of, of more than we see. And they understand the power of prayer. That's that's a beautiful witness as well. Yeah. Um, we're, we've been talking a lot about how women are a, a big part of this. Isn't there also a counterpart for men to participate? Yeah. So in the in the from the get go, I think within yeah. the very first hour that I was kind of unfolding this with father and, um, you know, I, I asked the question, I said, father, what about the men? He said, well, mm -hmm. so is the name given to you. You aren't naming this. This doesn't belong to you. This is God's work. And he said, seven sisters really speaks about women, doesn't it? And so we had a chuckle about that. But he said, you know, how about a lot? Men could serve as substitutes. That makes sense. So men can, um, once, if they understand what the holy hour is, it's not just filling in a blank uh, for someone or filling in that hour for someone. It really has a purpose. And as long as a woman explains how to uh, fill that hour, uh, yes, bring the bring the men. Many spouses fill in for their seven sister uh, wives, and many friends and neighbors have done the same. But long about 2018, there were a group of men in North Carolina, and they were looking um, at the really the benefits of this priest who was um, receiving these seamless holy hours. And they said, you know, we kind of want to get into the action. We know we're not women. We can't be part of the seven sisters. We can sub, but we'd like to fast. And so this group of men started fasting for the pastor, not for the seven sisters, but for the pastor. And um, there was, we have coordinators in different dioceses that are volunteers that work with the apostolate. And there was a, a volunteer coordinator in that particular diocese in, in North Carolina. And she emailed me and said, this has been terrific. These guys have started praying or fasting along with us. And it just seems to be such a strengthening force for the priest. Can we, what do you think? Can we keep going? So I asked uh, the, the founding chaplain, Father Johnson, and he said, by all means, let's do it. Let's open the door. There are things that scripture Jesus reminds us only come about by prayer and fasting. In fact, let's just not have it come about. Let's encourage it. So he said the only thing, uh, no fasting on Sundays or solemnities. And that was the way they were practicing it in North Carolina. So we, they aren't called seven brothers. It's called fasting brothers. And they, they determine um, themselves individually um, what that fasting might mean. And, you know, you, you asked me a little bit ago, Gina, about um, testimonies. And it's amazing that these beautiful testimonies are coming from the fasting brothers. And in fact, one um, testimony that was very moving was this man said, this is the most important thing I've ever done in the life of the church is to fast for my pastor. And he said, I've opened up something in my heart and in my willingness and really in my discipline that I did not know I held. And so for him, he was describing it as the strongest thing he's ever done. There's another beautiful story of a fasting brother. This is on the East Coast in a state up there. And they, um, the parochial vicar is one of the fasting brothers for his pastor. And I think, how beautiful is that? 
to intentionally fast for the priest who's really teaching you so many things in those early years of being a priest and how that must change his relationship and his love for that priest. That is incredible. You know, the power of prayer never ceases to amaze and surprise and humble me and everyone else and all of our viewers. Um, I, I think we neglect sometimes to recognize just how powerful a specific dedicated time to pray for any of our intentions, in this case, particularly our priest, I think we forget how much power there is in that because God answers our our prayers. I mean, he says, ask and you shall receive in Matthew 7, 7. Seek and you shall find, knock, and the door will be opened. And that is exactly what I believe this ministry is all about. We are asking, we are seeking, and we are knocking on behalf of these men, these men who have given themselves to the Lord and given themselves to us themselves as a sacrifice. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful reciprocation to these men to help them because they are after all men. I mean, we, we also, I think we forget that they're men. They're not, they're, they're, they are set apart, but they're not different. They haven't been, you know, God didn't come down with a magic wand and say, poof, you will never have a problem again. I mean, they struggle, they battle, and they're alone. So I think this is a beautiful, beautiful way that we can really give them something to help them help us. Right. And, you know, uh, here, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm done. Go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say a beautiful point and well made. And yet at the same time, I believe our prayers fortify the fact that they do have an ontological change in their ordination. And I think sometimes when the going gets tough, you know, our prayers to just kind of reinforce that or remind them, you are in persona, Christy. You are different. You are chosen and, and walk in that way, right? And we pray for their fidelity to the liturgy of the hours and their fidelity to the sacraments and, you know, all of the things that living the sacraments out themselves, but also they're the ones that are bringing the sacraments to us in times of confession and so forth. So it's it's been a, a beautiful, I would say, um, change in the women. A lot of their testimonies have attested to this where they said, I, I don't know what I was thinking about when I thought about how my pastor serves me, but I was very limited in that. And my sense was, she says, it wasn't like so small, like, okay, he has holy mass in the morning and then he goes home and kicks his feet up. It wasn't that. But I just, as I start to pray for him each week, I really say, Lord, guide me. What is in Father's week this week? How can I pray for this week? I don't have to pray for his whole life, but help me to know how to fortify his week. And as I started doing that, uh, I realized, wow, he, he's really got a lot going and a lot that I don't even know about. And so it's it's helped, uh, I think, women understand as sisters in Christ that these are our brothers in Christ, that they are also our fathers. And it's it's been humbling for many women and uh, tear provoking for a lot of us. And there are converts that this is one of the first things they've done for the church as they've come into the church is they've begun to pray for their priest. And how moving is that? We actually have about three or four Protestant women that are in the Seven Sisters Apostolate as well. They understand what they're supposed to do. Uh, maybe this is a stepping stone for them to, to become into the fullness of faith. I don't know. But they understand what they're supposed to do. They're called to do it and, and drawn to do it. And they're and they're faithful, so there's there's lots of fruit uh, of the apostolate that's that's being seen, and so much is interior, and it's it's a beautiful thing because as we pray, it's hard to articulate things that are happening within our souls, right? And yet women are saying, "I'm finding that I need to to tell people, I need to invite people into this because something's changing in me, and maybe something can change in them." And so it's just been, honestly, it has been beyond anything anyone could ever imagine. It's such a win-win because there's such a shower of graces for everybody involved. On that, 
let's talk about how some of our viewers, I'm sure by now, some of our viewers are thinking, how can I get started with the Seven Sisters in my parish? Let's talk a little bit about the process of setting this up at the parish and then taking it from there and what we can do from there to build the apostolate as well. Okay, good question. And it always gives me the opportunity to remind myself that when we get the stirring, any kind of stirring to move forward, to move from here to there, it, we have to give credit to of the stirring to the Lord. So right away, it gives us this opportunity to say, thank you, Lord, for inviting me into this work. I don't know what it is uh, so much, but I'm being drawn to it. I'm leaning toward it. And I always tell people we really respond to the invitation of Christ himself, who in Gethsemane said, can you not watch with me for one hour? And he's speaking to his disciples like he's speaking uh, to women today about it. Can you not watch with me for one hour? The church esteems the hour, right? Because Jesus esteems the hour. Uh, St. Faustina in her diary says something like, this is a reiteration of what she says, but something like, sometimes the Lord withholds those graces till the last few minutes of the hour. So the hour has this power, you know? And um, so once that sense of God is calling me to this, I think there's this surge of, of uh, I guess, a positive sense that it's going to come to fruition because he's not calling me to something that's going to go flat. He, he's calling me to something that he's honoring and he's blessing. So going into that with a sense of like, if God is stirring my heart, then he's stirring at least six other women to come alongside me. It's not to frustrate me. It's to help bring this uh, to completion. So some women uh, have done that. They, they kind of hold on a little bit and maybe they'll uh, practice a discipline and pray a discipline of a novena. And maybe to, to just wait on, Lord, who do I ask? I have an idea, but is this your idea? Some women, many women have done that. Uh, others uh, have a sense right away. I, I even have the names in my mind, their faces in my in my mind's eye. And so they 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 go out and they they start asking. And in that imitation of Christ, can you not watch with him for an hour and with me for an hour? And then what else does the Lord say? Come and see, right? Follow me. And so it, you might ask a woman that is really a little bit uncertain about how do I do a holy hour? And so be prepared to speak with her about a holy hour. Come and see, I'll come with you. Uh, this is how I pray, and this is how we might pray together. Uh, the apostolate has some guidelines that give people ideas. We trust that the Holy Spirit is going to be leading them. Uh, they're in the presence of the teacher extraordinaire himself. Jesus is there teaching us how to pray. So it's coming in uh, humble as a student in the school of intercession and learning how to pray for one person for one hour. It's 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 hard and it's a learning uh, curve. So uh, inviting personally, sometimes people use bulletins uh, you, with the permission of the pastor. Can I put this as a gift we want to give you, Father? We're, we're looking into this. I have a booklet you can read, a pamphlet you can peruse. Um, would it be okay if I invite other women? I don't know who the Lord wants to invite. And maybe this would be a way of learning who those people might be. Um, we do have pamphlets as as well that in a nutshell uh, kind of give uh, the story and, and the essence of, of the apostolate. It was designed by a woman in a seven sister in Kansas. And it's just, it's just the best. And a lot of people have come uh, to form groups just by reading it and understanding it in that way. The website, as you mentioned, Gina is full of, of lots of information. Sometimes that overwhelms people or you're going to, maybe you're asking someone, uh, that doesn't use the internet very, very well. And so you're the one that's going to be the one giving the information. So there's all kinds of ways, but it's always with this assurance that if God is stirring you, he is so totally stirring six other people at least uh, to join you. I'm going to make sure that we put the website in the description below as well. Oh, yeah. So when this go when 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 we put this when we post this out there, we're going to put that we're going to put the uh, seven the seven sisters apostolate website there Perfect. so that people can look and see what's on there because there is some great materials there. Um, 
there are there is a little prayer book that we can use that that Jeanette has put together. It's absolutely beautiful. There are beautiful pamphlets. The pamphlets are so beautiful. They are, they are, they were, it was just such a nice thing to have to pass up. I would have held one up, but I've given them all away. <laughs> They're all gone. I can't seem to keep them in my hands. Um, but, and the website has a lot. And another thing that Jeanette does is we get a monthly communique, which has a lot of great stuff to read just some just some beautiful uh testimonies some witness some instruction just beautiful things to contemplate and i make sure that my seven my six of my seven i'm with the seventh get them <laughs> now my group of seven sisters isn't just seven women there are seven of us but we have three one who doubles up on a day because it works and two others that aren't able to commit to a specific day but they do a holy hour when they can and Good. offer it along with what we do. Yep. Um, that's one of the things that we've done. Um, let's talk, let's also talk about like the possibilities of, um, of how we can um, not just pray for our own parish priest. Okay. One of the, one of the things that I think might scare people is do I have to go to my church mm -hmm. and pray? for my priest or can do i have to find somebody if i'm going out of town or you know if i find an alternate if i'm going out of town um or do i or can i pray where i'm at yeah good question and and that's the beauty of it and what many people comment on and what they like the flexibility that this mm -hmm. affords and that is um the commitment is really to the holy hour Yes, Lord, I will watch with you for an hour for this priest or bishop. And so that that can be done really anywhere. It could be done at your parish. Um, it can be done at a, a, a diff, another one. It could be when you're traveling. It can be done at a place you've never been. And um, the beauty of it is um, that flexibility affords your commitment to be kept, right? But you can also have us have somebody sub in for you if you don't if you're not really sure or you're you're not feeling well and you're just get, you know allow somebody else to have the privilege of that and so many times women maybe they can't commit for the full time as you intimated earlier Gina and they love just subbing in just once in a while and they love doing that and it's just it's a gift to them as well as uh, to the priest so the ideal would be before the blessed sacrament um exposed that's not always here in the Twin Cities where I live in Minneapolis and St. Paul. We have so many adoration chapels. It's hard to like, turn that's your awesome. head and not be near another one, right? And I know that's not the same in Montana, you know, where you're living really far apart or even rural Iowa or something like that. So we want it to be, you know, something that isn't like a transportation burden on people. But if people, sometimes they link their... Um, their time's out with doing their hour, or maybe they link it to uh, a mass. A, a mass wouldn't be uh, a substitute for the holy hour, but they could stay after or, or start the hour before and finish the hour after, something like that. Um, so it ideally, is, as said, the Blessed Sacrament exposed so many blessings when um, one tries to do that uh, and be faithful to that, but also in front of a tabernacle is, is wonderful. And even with that said, um, that we do have um, homebound women uh, that are faithful, wonderful members, exemplary in our apostolate. And it's um, I've been told over and again by them that they're so happy that they were asked to do something where they kind of felt now that they were at home, they were really of no use to their it's church. beautiful. And it's, it's, of course, if the Lord is calling them and they can stay faithful to that, during the COVID time, right? We had to stay at home for the most part. Some people, there were uh, chapels open and churches, and that was was good for some, but not for most. And so some um, made that little oratory that the catechism speaks about that we should all have in our homes. And that was their place of offering the prayer, but they were faithful to it. And they were happy to get back uh, to the chapels and churches. That's a beautiful witness as well. Um, as far as when we pray, is there like a specific, I mean, I don't say every week I do something different, but um, mm -hmm. that may not work for others. But um, 
does it, first of all, it is specific. That hour is specific for fathers. So when others ask you to pray for them, we're not including that in that hour. We are including everything that we're doing is specifically for father during that hour. Yeah. Um, some of the things I've done is I have prayed a rosary. I have done the stations of the cross in the church. Last weekend, I wasn't at home. I was at a conference at Franciscan University in Steubenville. And after the after the big holy hour of the evening, I went to at, on the campus. They have a Porziunkula chapel. Chaplet. It's a yeah. uh, uh, chapel. It's a um, it's a replica of the original in Assisi. And oh. I went in there and and did my holy hour there. And there are Bibles in the in the pews. And I grabbed a Bible and opened it up and just started <laughs> reading. And everything I read, I just I just read it and said, I am offering this part of scripture oh, for my priest. I am offering this part, this piece of the gospel for my priest. And the ribbon marker, the ribbon marker was at the the, the, the temptation of Jesus in the desert. Oh, so oh. I read that and That's I prayed for that for my <laughs> priest. And I thought, wow, this is oh, really beautiful. Really oh, beautiful. Not that he's being tempted or anything, but this is the reality of our world today. You know, this is the That's reality. So it was really fitting to pray that for him. What are some of the other, some of the other things that um, you've heard that women use? Yeah, and I should. I, I'm going to go one step back when you talked about uh, mm -hmm. committing committing to the hour. So, um, oh, for sure, for sure. Really, yeah. Uh, they they speak about themselves as committing to a day. So uh, you 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 said that you commit to Saturday. So interesting. I went to a several years ago. I went to a gathering. They they asked me to come and uh, say a few words and and meet the ladies. And so we were going to have a, a dinner afterwards. And so when we went around the room, the first lady says, "Hi, I'm Sister Monday." <laughs> And the next one, uh, she didn't tell me your name, but then the next one was like, I'm Sister Saturday. And so the women, it, it struck me. It, it was it was humorous, but in a, in a, you know, a good way. And they really identified with the day that they've committed to Father. So within that day, each woman uh, has a choice. And for some women, uh, they keep fidelity by having an hour on the calendar that's regular. If they don't, they may be, you know, they're at the end of the day and they realize, oh, my goodness, I haven't um, offered that for a father yet. I got to get going. So some women, th their fidelity is better kept if it's if it's a regular hour on their re regular day. For other women, as you're describing, um, you're, you keep fidelity, but it's in it's within a flexibility. And that's that's perfect. That's that's how I do my hour as well. And so however you keep your hour that's going to be the best for you. Then within the hour, uh, people really vary. Some people have a very regular uh, thing that they do. Uh, they kneel. See, people tell me specifically, I kneel for the first half hour and I pray a rosary and, and then I pray, you know, whatever. And then I leave maybe the last half a little bit more like, Lord, what does Father need this week? Because again, we're not praying for the priest's whole life. Each week we're praying for that week. So it really brings us so um, really intimate in a way of like, what's happening this week? If you're praying during Holy Week, it's very different than if you're praying during maybe another an, a, of ordinary time, right? Or if you're praying when there's lots going on in the parish, or maybe father has, has broken his arm or something, things just change on how you're offering these prayers. So nothing's, you know, there's no really right or wrong, just be faithful to the hour. And the Lord will will guide that. And the ideas that you have are, are ones I've heard over and again. Some women have uh, a sense of being led to pray the Stations of the Cross to offer those. You, they're, they're almost in every single adoration chapel, uh, or you can have a pamphlet with that. And um, it's, it's a fitting one for priests, the rosary as well. Um, and uh, scripture verses, as you pointed out, are ones that sometimes women will read the readings of, of the day, uh, knowing that Father is going to uh, give homily from that. You know, if they're, if they're reading this, if they're offering the hour early enough in the day where he hasn't offered Holy Mass, or maybe she's offering that for the next day. So scripture is used widely uh, with many of the seven sisters. 
Um, but what what ha, what I've learned uh, from listening to testimonies is that oftentimes women might start. They want to do it right. They want to fill that hour, and sometimes that hour seems so colossal. So many minutes sit. There's sixty of them. And, but she really wants to do it right. And that's, and that's, and she should. And sometimes she goes in with this like big stack of prayer cards and, and all kinds of aids. But I hear over and again that often those things kind of are, are shed a bit as she continues to be that student uh, in, in the school of intercession to learn how to pray for this priest. That often she's learning how to really rely on Holy, come Holy Spirit, help me. Uh, what should I pray? And um, and she's she's more confident. She starts to pray something in scripture and continues to pray until she senses a, a leading not to do so. So there's there's lots of, of different ways. And probably the most important you you brought up as well, that others will ask us to pray as they should and stay a little extra and pray for them or pray for them on the way to the holy hour. If you need to drive to get to where you are, include them in prayer. But Reserve that that hour and preserve it for for the priest or bishop. Yeah, that's a and sometimes that can be hard because totally. sometimes it's 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 a desperate a desperate prayer and they and they grab you on your way into church and they say this is happening in my oh, life yeah. and I don't know what to do and you know sometimes sometimes it's convenient to just sit there and pray with them for a minute and then start your hour after. Oh. Um, yeah. Other times it's we're sitting in the hour and people come up and talk and they want to chat and they ask questions. And sometimes that's happened to me. Yeah. Another thing I want to talk about so that everybody is aware that this kind of thing happens as well. Um, sometimes when I'm in my holy hour, and I'm probably not the only woman who experiences this, sometimes I have a spiritual attack that happens, a very strong temptation that pops into the mind or a or a very powerful memory that won't loosen up. Let's talk briefly a little bit about how to overcome those kinds of obstacles and how those are actually a sign of perhaps something that we don't realize it's a sign of. Yeah, I think we. this is universally shared exactly the way you described it. And it's one reason that holy water is at the entrance of every chapel and church, right? <laughs> So we have that reminder that we are baptized and we are covered and we know the evil one hates holy water, right? And um, But somehow it doesn't seem like it's fitting because here we are in the presence of our Lord and we've got these distractions and these, uh, you know, the spiritual warfare that's all about it. That How does that happen? But it does happen and they are temptations. And one of the things that... Um, I, I have done for a long time, and uh, even one of our patrons of the Apostolate, St. John Vianney, who's the patron of all priests, he says this beautiful thing. He says, one Ave, or one Hail Mary, one Ave makes hell tremble. And so often I will just uh, pray uh, slowly a Hail Mary. And it is amazing how that just kind of dispels anything that would try to come about you. And um, it's, it's some of the simple things, or even just uttering a glory be. Uh, no, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. You are proclaiming that to whatever is trying to come at you. You are giving glory uh, to the Trinity. Um, one of the things, too, kind of connected to that is sometimes maybe you're wrestling the whole hour. I've had hours like that. And I think, Lord, my prayers didn't even get to the ceiling of this chapel, right? And so I, I will kneel at the end. If I'm not already kneeling for the whole hour, I will kneel at the end for sure and say, Lord, I likely really flubbed up here. I, I was distracted. I didn't, I, I didn't really listen very well. Please come and apply your graces where they need to be applied. What this hour was to be about. Fill in the blanks. And I, when I end my holy hour that way, I just am reminded that this is God's work. He's asked me to cooperate with the graces in this work. And sometimes I don't do as well as I could or should. But he, it's his work. And so I, re, I remind myself. Uh, to bring him into that work at the very end and say, I need help. I know you'll fill in the blank and I can get up and I can be at peace. 
And I just believed that whatever was to be offered for that priest was offered. Oh, that's just beautiful. That's really beautiful. You know, I, I really hope that our viewers consider this as something that they take on. Um, have you noticed, have you noticed some, like at my parish, I noticed almost immediately um, just a, a, a different feeling when the women were, you know, when the women started praying, I, I just noticed a different feeling among, among all of us seven, but also among everybody. Everybody seemed to kind of, I don't know, gel into the, the life of the parish a little bit better. Yeah. And it, it kind of helped father kind of gel into his position because not only is he a new priest, he's so relatively new to us. He's only coming upon a year with us. Um, have you noticed other, I, I, I mean, I, I can imagine there have been a lot of stories about how there was obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And then when seven sisters began their ministry, suddenly those obstacles were gone. Yeah. Yeah, it happens that way. And sometimes it can be the opposite where things really start stirring mm -hmm. up such goodness as right. happening. But one of the things as you were talking, Gina, I was thinking about one of the hidden patrons that we have that really guides us, and that's Mary Magdalene. And I think of her at the, at the feet of Jesus and giving everything. And it's even in part of our statement. Um, you know, in, in, in scripture, in the, in the mouth of Judas, uh, one of the gospel writers says that he challenged her and said she was wasting this, right? But when I met with Father that very first day to explain this, I said, Father, what comes to my spirit is uh, we're offering a holy wasting. This is this is set apart, and some may look at it as wasted. You know, it's like an hour. You get a whole hour. You can pray for the world in an hour. Sure, we can pray for the world in a second. Mm -hmm. But God is calling us to pray for one priest in one hour. And so one of the things, um, getting back to your point, is when she slips down, when the Holy Spirit guides her, that is Mary Magdalene, to the feet of Jesus, uh, it's a dinner party, right? People are talking. They're not noticing her. But when do they notice her? They notice her when the aroma begins to rise in the room. And so to your point, I believe that as our prayers, they're often looked at as incense, right? Aroma to the Lord. We are the aroma of Christ ourselves, our lives, as we, we burn up for him, right? And as we offer our prayers, the church um, shows us that visual and um, that we can smell it too, right. that, and reminding us that our prayers are as incense. And I believe mm -hmm. that Lord, may our prayers rise like incense before. Exactly. And I believe as that aroma is affecting the atmospheres of our parishes, uh, we are seeing things. People are noticing. They're awakening. When when there, when that um, Mary Magdalene opened that flask, it was an aroma that was not to be at a dinner party. They understood that. And it's like, no, no, no. That is supposed to be reserved for some other use. Why are you using that here? You know, the challenge. And I think, um, you know, our prayers begin to affect. And, and there is kind of like, what's happening? Something's different. I don't know what it is, but I embrace it, right? I And I believe that this is this is what's happening. I hear it over and again that things are changing. And again, we're not claiming that our prayer is, is what's, you know, moving everything forward, but it is that drop. Exactly. That Mother Teresa says, if we didn't put that drop in the ocean, the ocean would have one less drop. And so we're putting seven drops into that ocean and we hope it's, it's nourishing and we, we trust it is. And we're seeing that it is uh, nourishing in incredible ways. And again, those are only the things we sense or even see, there's so much in the unseen um, that we're, we just, we accept, you know, we know it's happening and um, we embrace that too. That's just, you know, I, and I think that's important for everyone to understand. There may not be visit, it may not even be something that's tangible that you can put your finger on and say, it's just, it's just a little, and maybe it's our attitude that's a little bit different. Maybe it's the way I feel about my church exactly. and how I'm approaching it because I am laying myself down. I mean, the gospel says no greater love is there 
than to lay down our life for a friend, for a friend. And that is our priest. He is a friend. And I think that when you do that, I think it does. I think it opens us up individually, but I think others start to see it and they start to, I think they start to want what we have and <laughs> change right. a little bit, you know, even if it's just, even if it's not something you can put your finger on, like you said, the drop is a beautiful, that's a beautiful image of this, just a drop in the, in the ocean. But without that one drop, that one drop could make a, could make a difference. Exactly. It really could make a difference. And I think we forget Mm -hmm. how much of a difference we can make just by, just by saying, yes, Lord, Obedience. I'm going yeah. to offer myself as prayer. There was a woman, your, your, what you just said reminded me of a woman early on who told me uh, in confidence and in a great humility, she said, I was a woman who used to backbite priests. I gossiped. Mm -hmm. I, I spoke harshly about them and she got involved in seven sisters and she said, I'm, I'm changed. I'm a new person. She said, when I'm with people, I am the first person to speak up for that priest and to defend him. She said, I understand something about the priest that I didn't understand, but I also understand something about who I am and what's fitting and befitting to me. Um, and she says, I'm living more fully who God has designed me to be. So it's the perfect example of what you were just talking about. I, I, I do a lot of traveling uh, around the United States and speak to a lot of seven sister groups or those desiring to learn about seven sisters. And every time I go, I, it, I shouldn't be surprised by this, but there's so much joy in the groups that I, I speak with and have lunch with and pray with. I, I think it's what you're speaking of, Gina, that, we are being obedient to what God has called us to do. It's his work. We're cooperating with what he wants us to do. And it brings us this great joy. And I see it over and again. Not only that, but I've gone back to places like maybe two or three years later, some of the same women, and it's more joy. It, it, is, it is a fulfillment of something that um, is within each of us to do. And we are doing it. And because of that, we have that joy that, again, Mother Teresa says, it's the net for souls, right? It's attractive to other people. I think that is such a great visual, the net. You know, we're called to be, you know, the Lord called the apostles and said, I am making you fishers of men. And, you know, we're, that's an, that, uh, that great call to evangelization. And I think we are all called to evangelize. And this to me is one of the, I think it's an effective method of evangelization because it is beginning here. It's beginning with prayer and ending with prayer. And sometimes we want to go out and we want to say, we need to go to church. We need to do this. We need to fix this. We need to fix that. And we don't stop and say, wait a second, Lord. Where do we need to begin? What needs to change first? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just we need to start looking back towards that relationship. I mean, our, our life in faith is a relationship with the Lord. And yeah. you know, we are to love God, but we are also to love one another. And mm -hmm. this is a way that we build our relationship with that priest who is the he's right at the center of the cross. He's right at the cross point. Right for us. And I think it's a beautiful, this is just such a, this is just such a great ministry. I'm so glad that it was shown to me. You have a, I, I'm sure you have more thoughts. Go ahead and share some more thoughts. <laughs> well, just as you're speaking, I mean, you and I could be talking, do they know this is a three hour podcast today? I mean, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're kidding. And everything you say is just like, oh yeah, that's all hours. right. You're, you're so spot on with everything. But one of the parts of our logo says it's United Holy Hours, you know, that we, we it's Seven Sisters Apostle, United Holy Hours. And the monstrance is in the, in the middle of our logo. And it's just, it's exactly what you're saying. The, this unity that we start to sense um, and desire uh, because we're we're built to desire it, it just it brings us that joy and it brings us that sense of I want to keep doing this and I want other people to to be involved also. But along with that unity, what I'm thinking about right now is I, I just got a couple of emails this morning. They 
from different states, but one of them spoke about in her group, they have Vietnamese uh, sisters, uh, Spanish speaking sisters, and, and um, you know, uh, English speaking sisters. So she said, I feel like we're kind of this melting pot that just, um, we're just, we are united in our holy hours and we all have the same goal in mind. I mean, scripture tells us um, to pray for those in authority. So and it's an obligation. Uh, somewhere along the line, though, over and again, I hear Seven Sisters say, you know what? It doesn't feel like an obligation to me. It, it feels like a privilege to me to pray for priests. So either way, it is an obligation. If it moves into a privilege, wonderful. You know, it makes makes a lighter for a lighter prayer, perhaps. But it's, it's a beautiful thing that um, this other email uh, said the same uh, thing, uh, that she had uh, women from all different places that she of service in the church that she said, I never would have known them, but somehow she put a bulletin blurb in and, and different women responded. And she said, she's meeting women um, that she, she never knew even went to her parish. And she, she says, she felt like it was kind of this melting pot of like a unity that was being made of women that didn't necessarily know one another, but were really, you know, worshiping and being a part of the same parish. You know, I, I think we could probably sit here and talk for hours about the fruits of this <laughs> of this beautiful apostolate. I mean, so much has come. I mean, and you know, and when I think for, when I think moving, think ahead, moving forward, like I just think about my little group. Okay, some of the things we've talked about, like I've heard, so I've I've heard a lot of this with my with the six that I'm praying with as well. Like some of the experiences that I've had, I had a um, one of our sisters couldn't get inside the church for the holy hour. So she sat in her car and she just praised the Lord in her car mm -hmm. right there in the parking lot. And one oh, of the yeah. members of our church knocked on the window and said, I can let you in. And she said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm praying right here. <laughs> she just stayed right there and had this beautiful holy hour. Another one of our sisters travels a lot and she sends us pictures of the churches. This is where I'm doing my, my holy hour for father today. Oh, Thank you for setting this up. This is just such a beautiful ministry. And, you know, like I said last week, I was at the port in uh, at, at Franciscan University in Steubenville, and I had a beautiful holy hour. And all of the sisters in my group have, have had some kind of an experience. And when someone yeah. says, I can't make it this week, sometimes one of us will jump in and take, this, take a second hour yeah. for them. I took a second hour for one of um, my sisters, and I did exactly what you said, in one of your explanations, I did half of it before, like I, cause I sang at two masses and I did half of it after the one mass and I did the other half after the second mass. So I did a half hour and a half hour, but I got the whole hour in and, yeah. you know, and, and I think this is a beautiful way to kind of get away from those like sometimes our prayer life can get a little bit stagnant because we're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I think this is one of those ways that can help us to keep our prayer life fruitful and conversational and growing just as we're growing in our faith. It's never good to just stay doing the same thing over and over again because we're not growing. Yeah. And I think this helps us grow in our relationship with the Lord and it helps us grow in our love of our, of our church and our right. parish. And and he calls us out to the deep. You know, he says, come into the deep. And it is challenging. There's hard, I don't know if there's one or two people that have told me, well, I've I've done this type of holy hour of praying for one person. For the most part, 99.8%. No, this is brand new. You know, this is going out into the deep, a place of, of challenge. They they don't know how to pray. So they're they're dependent. And how beautiful that mm -hmm. you become humble right away. Uh, the Lord just loves that um, in us that we come to him saying, I don't know, I need help. And um, he will help. You know, he is our ever present help. So he's 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 wanting to teach us uh, how to do this. And there was a woman who had been a seven sister, she told me for about three years. And she said, all of a sudden, I realized I need to be doing this for my husband. You know, I understand now something. So she added another holy hour uh, for her husband. She says, I'm, I'm really helping him to get to heaven. And this is a way I can do it. I'm helping father to get to heaven. And this is a way I've done it. But now it transferred. And somehow she said it dawned on me, but not for three years, that this would be something that would be edifying for my marriage.
So lots of fruit come to that. Many women tell me they bring their, their children along with them. Uh, and they've learned so many things about the fidelity of praying for priests or just even how to, to stay quiet and, and in, in a prayerful way while they're uh, in a holy hour. They're, they're witnessing their mother uh, taking time to pray for somebody outside of their family. You know, and so lots of different ways of, of witnessing, as you alluded to, that our witness is so strong and, and we may not know it at the time, uh, but it, it, it comes back to us uh, with that sense, either from people themselves or, or we learn about it later. Yeah. So. That's amazing. Jeanette, thank you so much for joining us. Could you close us out in prayer? I, I will. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Oh Lord, thank you for calling us into your work. And thank you for meeting us here, for giving us all that we need for the work that you call us into. Thank you for your lavish of love. Thank you that it is enough to share with others. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you are helping us to love others in the way that you love us and in all things all glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen and on amen. this saturday mary be a mother to us amen in the name of the father amen and, the son, and of the holy spirit amen amen <laughs> oh, thank you Jeanette. Why is Ohio so far away from Minnesota? Huh? I know, I know. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to make. We'll meet for coffee in between. Day. Okay. I would love that. That would be fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much again for joining us, and have a wonderful day, viewers.